I want to welcome everybody. I'm Les Anderson, uh, Beef Extension Specialist at the University of Kentucky. And on behalf of the UK Beef Group, uh, Dr. Dare Bullock, Dr. Jeff Limcooler, uh, Dr. Katie Van Valen, uh, Kevin Laurent, and the entire beef crew here at the University of Kentucky, we welcome you and appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule tonight to uh, join our webinar. Our webinars have been uh, fairly well uh, attended and it's been kind of a staple of our educational programs since, the, uh, since COVID. It's our distinct pleasure to uh, host Dr. Katie Van Valen tonight. Uh, Dr. Van Valen is the beef, one of our beef extension specialists, and she and Kevin Laurent are based out of Princeton uh, at, at our research and education center. Uh, Dr. Van Valen uh, grew up and was a native of Kentucky and uh, spent some time in Bowling Green, uh, then went to uh, Michigan, I think, to finish up high school up uh, up there. So was kind of, I think, pleased with the Detroit Lions uh a performance this year in the NFL. Uh, Dr. Van Valen uh, finished her PhD at Iowa State University and joined us, is it four years ago now? Yep. Or three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and took Dr. Uh, Burris's uh, extension position there at Princeton. Uh, and she, Dr. Van Valen has established herself as a very critical member of our team. And we're really happy that she chose Kentucky to uh, to begin her career. With that, uh, I want to introduce Dr. Van Valen, and she's going to discuss with us the cost of cheap mineral. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us again tonight for, for another one of these webinars. These have been kind of fun for us to, to do during the winter months. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the the cost of cheap mineral, and and hopefully we will will arrive at, at an understanding of, of what we should look for in, in minerals and, and what can happen um, if we don't get the, the proper mineral out to our, our cow herd. So I always like to, to kind of start off and lay the groundwork for why minerals matter. And, um, you know, I look at this in a lot of different ways, but at the end of the day, minerals play a role, uh, a supporting role, if you will, in almost every process throughout the body. So whether we're talking about things like uh, muscle growth, muscle development, being in the, the beef business, that's something that's important to us. Um, fertility and reproduction, milk production, those are all things that are, are critically important when we think about uh, the productivity of our beef herd. And all of those things, you know, we often talk a lot about the big picture things like energy and protein, um, but they also require uh, these smaller uh, nutrients, these uh, minerals to, to support those roles as well. Um, so anything that you can think of that we ask our cattle to do, uh, there's at least one or more mineral that's supporting that. When we think about mineral supplementation, I get this question a lot. Is it is it needed? Do I need to put a supplement out there? So I've pulled together um, mineral... Uh, mineral requirements across this top line here, uh, and then looking at some of our uh, common um, forage uh, and, and supplement feeds, and anywhere where you see a, a red number on there uh, is an indication, an indicator that that feed stuff is deficient in that particular mineral. Um, so most of our feed stuffs are deficient in one or more minerals. Uh, and so what that means is we need to, to be able to provide a supplement uh, to fill in the gaps of that, that deficiency. Here in Kentucky, there are two minerals that I think a lot about and, and um, that we probably need to pay a little, pay a little more attention to, um, and that's selenium and copper. So I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time talking about those two minerals in particular um, and some of the work that I'll be sharing uh, related to selenium is part of some very long-term uh, research that has been uh, occurring here at the University of Kentucky's Research and Education Center uh, with our herd in Princeton. Um, a lot of this work predates my time at the university, so my predecessor here, uh, Dr. Burris, along with uh, colleagues of ours in the Animal and Food Sciences Department, Dr. Jamie Matthews and Dr. Phil Bridges, 
uh, are the ones that have really done a lot of this this work in this area of selenium that we're going to talk about. Um, and and you know we're pretty we are pretty fortunate to to have had that team here uh, in our in our department and in our college. Um, they I would put them up as among some of the the best in the world in terms of their understanding of of selenium uh, and selenium metabolism in cattle. And so um, we're going to take a, a little bit of closer look at, at selenium. Um, and I hope to kind of walk you through how we've arrived at what our current selenium recommendations are for mineral supplementation. So cattle require selenium at about 0.1 parts per million. That's the total diet. So if you're just looking at a mineral tag that's only three, you know, that has a target intake of three to four ounces, that's going to look more like um, 25 to, to 35 parts per million. Um, the FDA actually limits the supplementation uh, that we can provide on selenium. So we can't provide more than three milligrams per head per day. Uh, so that's why if you look at, at most mineral tags, uh, if it's a three ounce target intake, it's going to be about 35 parts per million. Four ounce will be about 26. Um, so you'll see that that's pretty common kind of across the board. Um, it's a common mineral deficiency that we see in our herds throughout the Southeast. Uh, common uh, symptoms or, or issues that arise from selenium deficiencies, a, a general unthriftiness, decreased weight gain, um, diarrhea, anemia, so impacts um, uh, impacts on, on animal health, uh, infertility, abortions, retain placenta, so some reproductive impacts as well. Um, this is some, this is kind of an older map, but if you look in the U.S., uh, most of Kentucky, we're going to be in that, that middle range, so that, that middle blue color there that's both adequate and inadequate um, in selenium. So it definitely, it can vary kind of throughout the state, um, but you can see that a large part of the eastern United States is deficient in uh, selenium. As we move into uh, areas in the western U.S., they may not, they're not as worried about selenium. And in fact, in some areas of the, the U.S. Uh, where you see those black dots, um, we actually have um, selenium accumulating plants that grow there. So they can actually accumulate large concentrations of selenium that would be toxic uh, to, to livestock that were to uh, ingest those. So... When we talk about some of these mineral issues, recognize that that producers, uh, say in the the upper Midwest, are dealing with a different set of environments and a different set of, of situations than what we have uh, here in the Southeast. So the big problem with selenium is that we can't feed more of it. We deal with deficiencies. So what do we do with selenium? Um, so the question really became, can we feed a better selenium? Is there a better source of, of selenium? Um, so there is, so traditionally we've um, supplemented with inorganic selenium. So in some of our, our more low cost mineral supplements, um, things like um, trace mineral blocks and some of those types of things, you'll probably see the inorganic form of selenium um, which is sodium selenite. Um, and then there's the organic, which is selenium yeast. So that's kind of the, the better form. So in general, um, mineral sources vary in, in what we call bioavailability, which is just a big word that means um, that for every mouthful that, she, that that cow consumes, that they're consuming a a more bioavailable mineral, the more of that mineral gets to where it needs to go to do its job in the body. So in the case of selenium, um, there was some work that was done, I, again, here at the University of Kentucky that looked at both blood and liver concentrations of selenium. Um, so ca the cattle in the gray bars here, they didn't have any supplemental selenium. Uh, then they supplemented with uh all of the selenium from an inorganic form, and then all of the selenium from an organic form. Um, so that's going to be the red and the green bars there that you see. Um, and so we can see, we see this nice little stair-step pattern. So 
As we start to supplement selenium, blood and liver concentrations go up. And then as we um, go on into that organic selenium, we saw that those concentrations then increased again. Um, so that's uh, that was some encouraging news that, okay, we can't feed more, but if we feed organic, we can improve trace mineral status or selenium status in our cattle. Uh, now, the group here uh, at UK, they they have done a lot of, of in-depth research um, looking at how different sources of supplemental selenium that, that are in our mineral uh, products that, that you buy at the farm store, how that impacts things like metabolism uh, on a on the cellular level. Um, and so they really get into the the nitty gritty and I won't certainly won't go through the breadth of their work tonight, but I just want to um, point this particular study out to you. Um, so this was looking at the same cattle that where we saw that nice stair step increase in their status. Um, they uh, took a sample of liver from those cattle uh, and looked at over 24,000 different gene transcripts. And they found that 80 of those uh, were affected by selenium. What they found that was kind of interesting is that 30 were affected by both the inorganic and the organic selenium. So those would be um, genes that we could say are, are um, selenium dependent. Um, so they get up regulated or downregulated depending on whether or not there's selenium or not. But what was really different, what was really interesting uh, was that there was 26 that were only affected by the inorganic form and 23 that were only affected by the organic form. Uh, and so when I talk about these genes affecting things, they're affecting things like nutrient metabolism. Um, that's important. Uh, when we think about cattle, they're in uh, thinking about cattle nutrition, they're thinking... Uh, affecting things like the immune system um, and, and how um, our cells are able to, to grow and, and, and how some of our tissues and organs function. Um, and so what kind of came out of this, the start of this work was, okay, organic seems to be better, but th we're also seeing this difference in, in how these genes are working. Um, with both the inorganic and the organic. And so is there a way that we could maybe provide both of those and maybe see some of those uh, benefits uh, in, in some of the work that was happening on, on a cellular level um, by providing both inorganic and organic uh, sources of mineral. So we've they moved into providing a mix of selenium and um, so that mix would be um, providing half of the selenium from the inorganic form, half of the selenium from the organic form. Um, and so looking at, again, looking at blood levels and liver levels, um, this dotted blonde down here would be the, the group that didn't receive any selenium. So they certainly uh, had some selenium deficiency uh, issues. Um, but What's interesting is that we really see that the mix in the organic selenium um, perform pretty similarly uh, in terms of, of looking at things like the blood and, and liver concentrations. Um, so that was some that was encouraging that we could that they could feed a mix of the two um, that again may allow us to see some of those benefits on the on the cellular level um, and still maintain that blood and, and liver concentrations. Um, this group has also done some work looking at impacts uh, and interactions between selenium, supplemental selenium sources uh, and fescue toxicosis. And so um, some of that initial work that was done, those cattle were fed up in confinement. And so we, they, this group really wanted to understand does, do we see some of those improved benefits when we put cattle uh, out on pasture when they're grazing the end of fight infected fescue that is the basis of, of, of many of our forage programs in the state? So um, this is some work uh, that looked at whether they graze toxic end of fight, so that TE stands for toxic end of fight, or novel uh, end of fight uh, fescue, the NTE, 
Uh, and then they were either, these steers were either fed uh, the inorganic selenium or that mix. Uh, so we're looking at average daily gain uh, in this first graph here. Uh, and so one of the things that's really interesting is that on the toxic end of fight, uh, we see a nice bump in, in we see a bump in average daily gain just by supplying that mix. Now, of course, we see a higher average daily gain over here uh, on that novel end of fight fescue, which we would, would expect, um, but we don't necessarily see that, that same improvement uh, in average daily gain, but there's a lot of other things that are kind of going on in the, the background and again on that cellular level um, that support um, supplying that, that mix of selenium sources. Um, then I know there's some, um, some follow-up on, on some of this work. Um, looking at this was a, a rel relatively limited number of cattle. And so uh, if we need to increase the, the number of cattle in those studies to see some of the differences that may be happening here uh, in terms of performance, um, that's, you know, that's some things that that, that group has, has discussed. Um, other thing, other um, interesting findings that, that we've seen from, again, looking at this interaction between the selenium sources and the fescue uh, is looking at uh, prolactin concentration. So, um, prolactin, we talk a lot about that in, in the fescue toxicity world. It's a, an indicator of uh, fescue toxicosis in cattle. So one of the hallmarks that we, um, that we see uh, when cattle have de uh, are experiencing fescue toxicosis is a, a decrease in uh, uh, circulating prolactin concentration. So these gray bars here, those are the cattle that were on uh, the the endophyte or the toxic endophyte fescue. So um, they've got their lower uh, concentrations of of um, prolactin, as we might expect, uh, compared to those that were on the the novel endophyte. Um, but again, what's interesting is that we start to see um, potentially a, a little improvement in prolactin uh, with the the mixed treatment. So. Um, there's a there's about a dozen or more other studies that that the group uh, here at UK has has worked on in this space and, and trying to understand again what's really happening on a, a cellular level. Um, they have seen some really interesting impacts on uh, reproduction, um, looking at at progesterone concentrations with the mixed uh, selenium. Um, so we've got that increased um, progesterone concentrations. We may have. Uh, improved fertility, and so we we have seen time and time again uh, some of these these same um, same uh, results from a number of their work and so a number of their studies, and so ultimately that's led us to to make the recommendation uh, that half of the selenium uh, in your mineral mix should come from a the selenium yeast source, uh, and so. Uh, when we make those types of recommendations, uh, I just hope you understand the, a little bit more about some of the uh, the work that goes into to getting to that point, because that was just a, a small sampling of of the work that was done on this uh, on this in this area to get us to the point to make that that recommendation. So. If we're looking at a mineral tag, and this is just a, a random uh, mineral tag that I've pulled, and it's got the ingredients uh, section of that mineral tag. Um, if we're looking at that, uh, and and we're trying to determine whether or not our mineral has the selenium yeast, that's the that's the organic form. That's the keyword that we're looking for. Um, so if we read through this. Uh, list of ingredients we'll see in this one selenium yeast comes up now we're looking for that blend so we'll also see sodium selenite here now i will point out that um the list these ingredients are listed in order of of the inclusion of their ingredient however um selenium yeast and sodium selenite for example um differ in the actual amount of selenium uh, that are in that are are in there. So if you had um, just for for easy math, if we 
we had a hundred grams of, of, um, of one mineral and it was only 10% selenium, then that would only give us 10 grams where if another one, another one was 50% selenium, we would have about 50 grams of selenium. So I say that to say that we can't look just at this, the order in which they fall on this ingredients list uh, to tell us whether or not that's a uh, half or half uh, mixture of those two um, products. Um, so the best, the only way we can really know that uh, is to ask the question of our, our feed retailers um, and they should be able to, to get that information for us. So um, I put this, this slide together back in the, the fall for another talk. Uh, and so I have not updated the calf prices down here. The reason I haven't updated those is because I haven't, I don't have updated mineral costs that those have changed. So I left it as it was. Um, but this is looking at the cost of a 50 pound bag of mineral. Um, so using the UK beef IRM mineral, uh, the 50-50 blend, uh, which is the, the recommendation. Or if we take that same mineral uh, and take out the organic selenium and just have all of the organic or all of the selenium coming from sodium selenite, um, that cost difference. And again, this is just, this is the, the prices that, um, that we've paid for them. We don't necessarily get special pricing or anything like that, but we do, we do order in bulk. Um, we're looking at a dollar difference uh, per bag. Uh, if we think of average mineral intake per cow, if, we deter if she's supposed to eat three ounces per head per day, um, and we multiply that out by 365 days of the year, um, she's going to eat about 1.4, one and a half bags of mineral. So at a dollar a bag difference, um, that additional cost per year is a uh, dollar forty. Um, total annual costs on that that particular mineral program in this example was about thirty-two dollars. Um, so uh, per head. So. Um, I think that's that's important to to throw out there because I I know some of you all may be thinking that we pay a lot more for for mineral than that, um, and and so this is my kind of my first point of of pointing out that a a adequate or say an adequate or or good mineral program uh, doesn't necessarily uh, have to be the most expensive one. Um, I put on here the the value of of that calf because if we think about some of the impacts on of selenium deficiency on on reproduction and we miss uh, we have an open cow um, she didn't uh, get bred uh, or she lost that calf or that calf has had some some health issues uh, because of of complications from selenium deficiency um, we can see there the, to make that comparison. Um, it doesn't have to to break the bank uh, to put out a, a decent mineral uh, to cover our basis on that. So now we're going to switch um, switch gears here and talk a little bit about copper. Uh, so copper is another mineral that we see quite a bit of deficiency uh, with here in the state of Kentucky. In fact, uh, I was on a Zoom call early last week. Uh, that Dr. Arnold, our extension veterinarian, was on, and, and she mentioned that uh, that's something she's been seeing quite a bit of. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we uh, potentially see some of that, uh, see some copper deficiency here in the state, uh, is that we have got the uh, availability of some uh, feeding some co-product feedstuffs to our cattle that can be pretty high in sulfur concentrations. And so if we look over here at this, this mineral wheel, uh, each of those lines are, that are connecting one mineral to another is a point that those uh, minerals potentially interact, and we call that a mineral antagonism. Uh, so with sulfur and uh, molybdenum, they uh, will form an interaction uh, with copper. And so basically what happens is we have higher levels of sulfur or high levels of molybdenum, which we do have. I There have been a, a few instances of that. I know in, in parts of the state, it's not necessarily a widespread problem that we're aware of, but but sulfur certainly from some of the, the byproduct feedstuffs 
um, can cause that copper uh, deficiency to occur. Um, some of the, the symptoms associated with copper deficiency uh, are anemia, uh, decreased growth, um, potential changes in hair color. Um, so black, um, black headed cattle may take on more of a, a khaki appearance, but I will, I will note that that is not uh, the, always the case. Um, we certainly, I have seen instances where we've created a, a very severe copper deficiency and haven't seen that, that change in pigmentation, but it is something that can happen, um, but isn't always a, an indicator necessarily of a copper deficiency. Um, diarrhea, decrease uh, or impaired reproduction performance, um, skeletal issues. So copper uh, it helps with the formation of some of the um, connective tissue. Um, so we can run into um, to some skeletal issues with severe copper deficiency. Uh, and, and again, in severe deficiency, we can run into to issues with uh, cardiac failure as well. Um, so these are some, this is some older data out of uh, Tennessee that looked at um, fescue concentrations of copper and um, sulfur. And so if current recommendations on copper requirements are 10 parts per million of copper, um, we can see that in this particular sampling of, of forage, um, they were all uh, deficient in copper, which would mean we need to provide copper, a copper supplement. Um, most of these uh, were, had pretty typical sulfur concentrations um, around that 0.2. Uh, some of these got up to, to 0.3%. Um, we can see that that copper uh, antagonism start to occur around 0.3%, um, where we, and this is total diet, um, sulfur, um, where we really, I get real concerned uh, about sulfur um, and where you'll most likely see a, a negative impact um, before you ever realize that you have a copper deficiency problem uh, would be the uh, risk of cattle developing polio encephalomalacia or, or PEM, um, which is a neurological condition that, that occurs from sulfur toxicity. Um, so, uh, we see that uh, in high, higher grain diets, we see, can see that at, at 0.4 total sulfur. Uh, in higher forage diets, it's a, a little bit higher, 0.5. And so um, we start taking in um, these high sulfur co-products, um, things like um, some, some of our wet cake that, that comes in from some of the, the fuel ethanol distilleries out of state that, that finds its way over here. Um, some of the stillage can be high in sulfur. Um, and so we start feeding, um, you know, relatively large concentrations of those high sulfur feedstuffs. We also can't forget the sulfur that is in uh, the forages, uh, that we may have sulfur in some of our water sources. And so it's all of those sources together of sulfur um, that can ultimately um, cause that copper antagonism or cause uh, development of, of polio. So current recommendations for copper, um, just depending on uh, whether we're looking at, at cow-calf minerals versus um, stalker minerals or high mag minerals, generally you're going to see them range from 1,600 to, to 2,000 parts per million of, of copper. Um, on the IRM mineral, the current recommendation is that a quarter of that copper should come from an organic or chelated uh, source. So similar to that selenium, we were looking... We're looking for a, a little bit better form of, of copper. Um, so looking back at that same mineral tag, when we're looking for things that are uh, organic or, or chelated, uh, we're looking for uh, words like this amino acid complex, for example. So copper amino acid complex uh, would be a, a, a organic or chelated form. Um, you may also see something like copper protein protonate, um, you may see something like copper lysine. Um, the typical or inorganic form that you're going to find uh, is copper sulfate. So um, you'll probably see, you may see both of those on there. In cheaper mineral products, you may only see, or lower quality mineral products, I should say, 
uh, you may only see this, this copper sulfate. Um, so we're also looking for that additional um, source of copper in there as well. So we've talked a little bit about um, some of those key minerals that that really are are the ones that if I'm gonna if I'm gonna send you out to to pick out a good mineral program, uh, we need to make sure that that we address um, some those two trace minerals in particular here in the state. Uh, things like zinc and manganese, for example, are other minerals that we just don't typically see any uh, deficiency of. Um, but uh, copper and selenium, we certainly do. And so they're two that um, if you can at least remember to, to look for those on the tag um, and make sure we get the right kind of, of selenium and copper in our mineral, we'll be, um, we will be better off. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about now switch gears a little bit and talk about building a mineral program um, that'll work for your herd. So um, I know it's hard to interact on Zoom, but uh, I'll throw the question out there of is this a does this look like a good mineral program? Um, the pro hopefully you answered no. Um, the problem is that most of the, most of these blocks, um, a white salt block is just that. It's just white uh, salt. Um, even if you move to something like a red salt block that that is um, marketed as a trace mineral block, uh, it has got some trace mineral in there, um, but it is still about 95 to 98, 99% salt. And the problem with that is that the cattle are not going to consume enough of this block to get enough mineral out of it. The other issue with these, um, we haven't talked as much tonight about macro minerals like calcium and phosphorus and magnesium, for example, um, but these products don't have, uh, typically don't aren't gonna contain our macro minerals. Um, so they're just, they're not a complete mineral. Uh, the cattle can't consume enough of them. Um, I put on here, this is true regardless of color. Uh, when I went looking to put this slide together initially a couple years back, uh, there was a company that would let you order a custom uh, mineral block color. Um, so regardless of what color you pick out, it's not a good idea. Even the the pink Himalayan salt, uh, still not not a good mineral program. Um, that salt limits their, their total intake, so they're not going to eat enough of it. Um, the other problem that we have um, is sometimes we we want to leave out a, a salt block with our other uh, mineral um, supplements. And the problem is if we've got a free choice mineral supplement out there that already contains salt, um, salt is, is what is really driving them to consume that other mineral product. Um, and so if you've got a the herd comes up to the, the water and you've got a salt block over there and you've got a mineral feeder over there uh, and a portion of the herd goes and, and looks on that salt block, they have reached their uh, their need for salt and they may not visit that that mineral feeder and get the, the other mineral uh, that they require. So um, unless um, a product specifically says to mix a, a X amount of, of white salt with it, um, you don't want to leave out an additional uh, source of salt. This is another um, type of mineral supplementation or mineral supplementation practice that we get a lot of questions about. Um, so is this a good mineral program? Um, so uh, in some circles, this gets referred to as a free choice mineral, um, which is not, I call Free choice mineral in my mind looks a little bit looks different than this, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so for purposes tonight, we're going to call it cafeteria or buffet style minerals. Um, so the idea here is that each of these boxes in this feeder has a individual mineral mix um, in it. So there's maybe a couple mineral, a couple different minerals in each of these with some salt probably. Um, and the idea is that cattle. Uh, know what they're deficient in um, and will be drawn to what they're deficient in. Uh, and as we move from throughout the year or from one pasture to the next, uh, that they can change their mineral intake to match what's available to them in the pasture. The 
problem with this whole concept is that cattle lack nutritional wisdom. Uh, so nutritional wisdom uh, means that you and I can, can go out to the restaurant, uh, maybe order a, a nice steak dinner, and maybe we have the option between a uh, for a side of uh, a loaded baked potato versus uh, green beans. Uh, you and I know which one of those might be healthier for us, uh, which one we might actually need, uh, but we also know which one might taste better. Um, our cattle are going solely are going solely off of palatability and really um, their their desire uh, to consume salt. Um, so they do not have a, a nutritional wisdom. Um, and most minerals, quite frankly, they're, they're heavy metals. They're not very palatable. Um, and so we really have no idea what they're consuming when we've got this type of practice. And, and um, you know, I'm really afraid you can set yourself up for, um, for having some deficiencies in some of those critical minerals uh, with this type of, of program. Uh, not to mention, it's, I hear it's a lot of work to, to keep all those different boxes full and, and organized. And so there's a, there is a simpler way. Um, what about injectable products? So um, there's uh, injectable uh, products that contain uh, multiple trace minerals. So copper, selenium, manganese, and zinc. Um, right off the bat, these are, are not designed to be a replacement for a, a um, oral mineral program. Um, they can supplement it. So they, these products do work in the sense that they will improve trace mineral status. Um, so this is some work that was done uh, at Iowa State uh, while I was up there with one, by one of my grad school colleagues. Um, and so he had to, uh, he had a bunch of cat, a bunch of calves in the barn and gave them either an injection of saline and an injection of, of multi-men or a, um, a, some different mineral paste and oral drenches uh, and boluses. But for the purposes of this, we're really focused on this, this line here that's different from all the others. Um, so these are the, the cattle that received multi-min. Um, and so this asterisk here is kind of the average of where everybody started. So if we look at their, their blood levels of, of multi-min, just eight hours after we give that injection, they've increased really nicely. Um, they decrease so pretty quickly by about 48 hours. Um, but then we start to see that. So that selenium that we've injected has gone into the blood system um, and moved on to the liver, which is where cattle store uh, selenium. So about 48 hours later, we see this nice increase in liver selenium concentrations. Now, you'll see that it drops off again pretty quickly. And the reason for that is that these cattle were not selenium deficient to start with. Um, they were on a, a um, uh, oral mineral program as well. Um, and so, as I mentioned, minerals are, are a heavy metal uh, and in too high concentrations can be toxic. And so uh, the body works really hard to not accumulate any more mineral than it needs. And so that's what's happened here uh, is that those liver concentrations of selenium decreased really um, pretty quickly um, because those cattle were not deficient. Um, but in situations where we're dealing with uh, deficiency or we suspect a deficiency, um, something like the uh, injection of, of multimin can write a, a mineral deficiency quickly but it also needs to be coupled with an oral uh, mineral program, a daily mineral program to go along with that. Um, most likely because of what we talked about in terms of, of um, the cattle getting rid of the extra mineral if they don't actually need it, if they're not uh, deficient. Um, when you look through all the research that's been done on this particular product, there's variable responses uh, in things like reproduction, growth, uh, immune function and, and response to stress. Um, and some of that may just be due to the fact that, that cattle in those studies uh, may not have been deficient to start with. So they really didn't need um, that extra uh, dose of, of mineral uh, at that time. But uh, again, if it's a situation where we're trying to quickly uh, correct a mineral deficiency, it can, it can be a good use for, for that. 
Um, it's a product that we have to get th through our veterinarian. Um, and like anything uh, that we're, we're administering to our cattle, I, I always um, caution people to uh, read the directions, follow the label directions, uh, and, and use it appropriately. So free choice mineral is really the, the easiest way that we have to supplement cattle on pasture. And when I, I recommend mineral programs for people, this is what I'm talking about. Let's get a, a good mix, a good mineral mix, put it out in our covered feeder, um, and then we can forget about it for, for a few days. We don't need to necessarily overcomplicate it. Um, most of our free choice minerals are formulated for target intakes of about three to four ounces per head per day. Um, and that'll be, that information is usually on the mineral tag. Uh, so this means that a 50 pound bag should last 50 cows about five days. Um, so I put that out there because a lot of times people will tell me that they think their cattle are going through mineral um, much more quickly than, than they think they should, uh, or they think they're not eating it. Um, so one of the things that we can try to do is is actually measure, you know, roughly measure mineral intake. Um, so if we put put that 50 pound bag out there again, should last 50 cows about five days. Uh, we also need to remember that that calves will access those mineral feeders and when they're um, pretty young, uh, so they'll start uh, co to consume some of that mineral as well. So if those 50 cows have calves at their side, uh, that that same five day uh, may not maybe closer to the, to three or, or four. So um, that's not to say that we're only going to put a, a bag of mineral out every five days. So let's make sure that that mineral feeder doesn't run out uh, and we keep mineral in it. Uh, I like covered feeders, um, minerals that, that get wet, depending on the, the source of that mineral that's, that's in there. Some of those minerals, when they get wet, uh, can actually go into solution. And when the cattle consume them, uh, it gives off a metallic -y taste, uh, which is off-putting, um, and they may decrease their intake. Um, also, the the texture of that mineral is going to uh, change if it gets wet. So a covered feeder, uh, we always recommend close to a water source, just because if we think about animal behavior, grazing animal behavior, uh, the herd comes to, to visit the water source, uh, and they'll find that mineral feeder there. Um, I caution you, though, that not all free choice minerals are, are created equal. So we do need to take some time reading the, the mineral tag. Um, and at the end of this, I'll drop a link in the chat. Um, we've got a, a publication that, that walks you through how to read a mineral tag in a little bit more in depth, because I know that's something that uh, there's a lot of information on that tag, and it's something that can get a little bit uh, overwhelming if we're not sure exactly what we're looking for. Um, but some key things that, that we can tell looking at that mineral tag uh, is whether it's a free choice mineral. So it's one that's designed to, to take it, put it in the mineral feeder and, and, and walk away. Or if it's uh, what we call a mixing mineral, which is um, for cattle that are on feed can be a really great option because uh, we can mix that mineral right in if we're feeding a, a TMR. Um, and then we don't have to worry about whether or not they're visiting that mineral feeder and what their intake is, because in every mouthful of that feed, they're getting the mineral that they um, that they need. So the concentrations that you see in this guaranteed analysis section, um, that's going to um, be dependent on what the target intake is. Um, so, for example, uh, a Three ounce target intake mineral may have um, selenium, those selenium concentrations uh, of about 35. Uh, but if it's a four ounce, it's going to be closer to 25 or 26. Um, so, right off the bat, if I'm comparing a three ounce intake mineral to a four ounce intake mineral, I'm probably thinking, well, that one has less selenium. It's not as good. But again, um, we need to make sure we're comparing apples to apples that, that we're looking at at both three ounce and take minerals or, or both four ounces. Or if we have a, a two that are, are different in intakes and um, that we're at least um, comparing them um, similarly. So we kind of walked through some of this already with the copper examples, um, but this is a, another slide here. So the ingredient section, that big long paragraph is where we're going to find all of the information uh, about the sources that are in that product. Um, so this one, for example, 
has got copper proteinate, which is a different organic source of copper um, than this one down here has got copper amino acid complex. Um, so that's two the examples there of that organic or um, sometimes it's called chelated um, copper. That's just that more bioavailable form of copper. You can see that both of those have copper sulfate uh, in them as well, which is that, that inorganic form. Some other um, special considerations for minerals, um, high mag minerals. So this time of year with our uh, spring calving cows, we, we don't have this out already. We probably need to get it out there as they start to, to move into their calving season. We want to provide um, mineral for the, our high mag mineral about 30 days prior to their expected calving date. Um, the reason for this is those lactating cows, as we move into to springtime, um, grass growth, um, we, we are putting those cattle at risk of developing um, uh, grass tetany, which is a, a magnesium deficiency. Um, so um, putting out a, a high mag mineral this time of year um, it can be really helpful. Other times that we need to think about is some of our cereal grains um, that can be really high in, in potassium um, may also require some, some high mag uh, mineral there as well. Um, just some general guidelines. Total magnesium intake should be about 22 grams or more per head per day. Um, so for a four ounce uh, intake mineral, which most of the high mag minerals are going to be that four ounce target intake, uh, you're looking at about 12 to 14 percent uh, magnesium. So um, another common question we get on high mag is, is it safe to feed year round? Um, you know, people don't want to forget uh, it, to make that change and, and have an issue with grass tetany. Um, so they'd rather um, just feed it year round or uh, maybe they they uh, got a deal on a, a pallet full and they want to just be able to feed it all out. Um, that's fine. Um, typically, you're, you're seeing a, a price difference with the high mag mineral. And so that's why you may not want to feed it year round. But again, depending on your situation, um, from a from a safety standpoint, uh, it's fine to to feed that. Other um, considerations would be um, co-product, what we call co-product balancing minerals. Um, so for diets that are um, higher in corn and some of our byproduct feeds from the distillery industry or ethanol and distillery industries, um, we run into an issue. So most of the time. Um, our, well, our cattle's requirements for calcium and phosphorus are in a two to one ratio. So two times calcium to phosphorus. Uh, we can get that ratio all the way down to a, a one to one uh, without running into problems. Uh, although I, I feel much more comfortable with that being closer to a, a 1.5 to one. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of the, the grains that we feed to our cattle are lower in calcium and higher in phosphorus. So that two to one or one and a half to one ratio is almost is flipped in a lot of cases. Uh, and so we can uh, le run into issues um, where, where those calves and feed um, can develop urinary calculi or stones. Um, and that is can be a, a fatal condition for them. Uh, and unfortunately, it takes a while for those stones to, to form. So we may not realize it's an issue until later in the feeding period. So um, feeding something like a co-product based mineral, um, this is a, an example of a guaranteed analysis from a co-product mineral. Um, so you'll see there is quite a bit more calcium in here than phosphorus. If we think about a, um, a typical um, two to one mineral um, that would have twice the amount of calcium as phosphorus, you can see that this one has has quite a bit more calcium than, than phosphorus. Um, there are um, there are some feed mills that are uh, making stillage balancing minerals because stillage is, we've got that same issue with the calcium, but it can be really high in some, it can be high in some other trace minerals. Um, so there, you may also see that uh, being being advertised. I've seen that come, uh, come across my, my desk a few times in the last couple of years as well. So this is a this is an example um, of two mineral tags that were actually sent to me by um, by a county agent. I wanted to get my thoughts on 
on each of the tags um cuz they had a producer that was um able to to purchase one of these one of these minerals uh from their local feed store um but there was about a a $10 per bag uh price difference in these two minerals um so he the producer wanted to know what's the what's the right one which one should i go with um, you know, if he needed to buy the more expensive one, that's fine that he would do that. But he just wanted us wanted a, a second set of eyes on that mineral tag. And, and the agent sent it to me and I thought it was a, a really good example. So what I did here um, is I took the high mag um, recommendations from the beef IRM uh, high mag mineral. Um, and those are available online um, if you search for UK beef IRM mineral. Um, and I tell people all the time. Um, you don't have to, that's not, you don't have to use that mineral, um, but it, at the very least, it can be a really good rec, uh, source to, to take with you to the, um, to the feed store if you're looking at minerals and, and maybe use it as kind of a, a guideline of what to look for. So I went ahead and did some of that, did that work for you. So anything that you see in green is something that has met uh, the mineral requirements or, or met that kind of that recommendation. Anything that you see in red uh, might be uh, either it's too low or it's extra, it's not needed. Um, and then you'll see some some yellow color on there. Um, and that's stuff that um, is not necessarily in either uh, mineral, but we see um, that maybe it shows up in, in both minerals, although it's not in the, the IRM mineral. So if we look at these, the one of these is not like the other. One has quite a bit more green to it than the other. Um, so I think we can all agree that mineral B has more green. So which one's the better choice? Uh, so if we go with B, um, then the next question is, is which one was cheaper? Um, and in this particular situation, uh, high mag mineral A was actually more expensive uh, than high mag mineral B. Uh, even though B was a, actually a, a better choice. Um, so quick note on uh, vitamins, um, because those are typically included in our uh, mineral products, at least our, our better mineral products are going to contain vitamins. Uh, rumen microbes can synthesize B vitamins and vitamin C, but they cannot um, synthesize vitamin A and E. Um, some of the products uh, out there will have vitamin A, D, and E. Really, unless our cattle are totally inside, they don't necessarily need vitamin D. Um, but a lot of our feed mills, they're buying a vitamin premix that they mix into their mineral product. Um, so that vitamin premix may have D in it. Uh, and that's why you'll see um, vitamin D come along in a lot of these. Um, one of the things you'll note if you start looking at vitamin concentrations and minerals is that they vary greatly. Um, so the UK IRM for vitamin A was 100,000. Uh, this one was 250,000. This one's 75,000. That's a lot of difference. Um, that lactating cow's got a, a value of a, a, a requirement of about 54,000. Um, and so the question becomes which one is right? Um, Keep in mind that vitamin A in hay um, can supply 50 to 100% of the vitamin A requirement. That is going to be um, quality dependent. There's quite a bit of variation there. Um, but green leafy forages are also a really good source of, of vitamins. Um, so I certainly wouldn't want to see you go any lower. Um, but um, we can we can get by without providing 100% of the, the vitamin A requirement as a, a supplement. So that's why you'll see the IRM mag mineral isn't hitting that 54,000. Um, I'd be a little concerned over here uh, getting too much lower than, than what we've got there. So um, this is another uh, table I put together a while back uh, looking at mineral cost of, of, of cheap mineral versus uh, what we call, what I'm going to call good or better mineral. So uh, white salt blocks, yeah, it was $7.79, and based on typical intake, that might be a, an annual cow cost of about $5, um, but you don't have any of that selenium, you don't have any of that vitamin A, 
Um, so you're setting yourself up for potential deficiencies of both of those among amongst other minerals. Um, trace mineralized blocks, um, some of those may have uh, selenium in them, some may not. Um, again, uh, setting ourselves up for uh, potential deficiencies there. Uh, complete mineral. So this is a, a free choice mineral. And when I said that they're not all created equal, this is what I mean. This one only had inorganic selenium. Um, the cost on that one was $25. It was from a local farm store. Um, so it was not adequate in selenium, but it was adequate in vit vitamin A. Uh, it was $32. In this particular example, uh, we go up about $5 a bag uh, and got a, a better quality uh, mineral in terms of that selenium and vitamin A. Um, so, um, so keep in mind that an expensive mineral uh, is not always a good mineral. Um, so that high mag example is a, a prime example where that cost ten dollars more a bag wasn't a, wasn't necessarily the better mineral out of the two. Um, so an expensive mineral is all, is not always a good mineral, and a cheap mineral can be expensive. Uh, if we start running into to issues with mineral deficiency problems um, because we haven't put out a, a good mineral, um, again, with cattle prices being what, where they are. Um, we don't we don't want to run into any of those issues. So uh, we can get a, a decent quality mineral out there uh, at a, a relatively affordable price. Um, I showed you some examples of, of that earlier. Um, get it out there, get it in a covered mineral feeder um, and and don't worry, you know, don't worry about it. Let's uh, not overcomplicate it. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions and I'll stop sharing my screen because I know uh, Dr. Anderson is going to share his. Please type any and all questions you have into the chat. Um, Dr. Van Valen, there's one over there now. Okay. Does UK right. offer the mineral with fly control plus CTC? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, we don't have the uh, mineral um, rec with fly control or, or CTC in it. Um, that would be a, a good example of where you might take that uh, that recommendation sheet with you, though, um, and, and make sure that if you're looking at adding um, something like a, a fly control product uh, or CTC to your mineral that you're still... Um, getting close to or at least meeting the, the minimums on, on some of those minerals, in particular selenium and copper. Um, you know, if you're a little, if it's a little less on something like manganese or zinc, I'm not as worried about that um, um, in that situation. Um, let's see. I calve in September and October. Do I need high mag? Um at calving or in spring? So good question. Um, so we typically worry about that in those peak lactating cows uh, in those spring conditions. The only time um, I worry about that more in the, the fall calving cows is if we've got them on something that's um, uh, a feedstuff that may be pretty high in potassium, like some of our, our wheat. Um, but for most, in, most situations, um, if we're feeding a, a grass hay throughout the winter, we typically don't run into too much of an issue um, with with grass tetany. Um, let's see. Uh, what color is khaki color in black cattle? Good question. Um, I wish I had the picture of it because a, a colleague of mine has a really great example of that. So they um, they actually had some some black Angus cattle. Um, at a research station uh, at another university, and they made them copper deficient. Um, and those cattle truly changed. Uh, they looked at like the color of khaki pants. That's the best way I can describe them. Um, copper uh, is is a part of um, one of the proteins in the body that that controls um, hair color. Uh, and so when you get them severely copper deficient, they can. Uh, can start to change that color. So yeah, I um, they've always nicknamed that particular those particular calves khaki. So um, 
that's the the best way I have to describe it. They so they truly the hair coat starts to look like khaki pants. Um, I focused on selenium and copper. Are these the two most critical minerals um, one should watch for generally and year round? Um, yep. So those are the two that I get uh, most worried about in terms of of deficiency. Um, you know, we I touched on the high mag quite a bit as well. Um, you know as far as some of our um our special cases with with the macro minerals um again i pay attention to, to that calcium and phosphorus ratio but when we think about the the trace minerals uh year round selenium and copper are the two that um time and time again um if i see a, a mineral deficiency or i'm talking to the veterinarians that um, are are seeing a lot of that that data come through the diagnostic labs and that sort of thing. Um, if you ask them what they're seeing, those are the two that pop up time and time again will be selenium and copper. Uh, should we be using the UK high mag right now while we were are calving? Um, so regardless of if you you don't have to use the UK IRM high mag, um, but having a high mag mineral out. Um, as we get these these cows coming into to spring calving um, would be ideal. We can start getting that uh, mineral um, into them, get their intake coming up a little bit um, as we start to, to prepare for this um, green uh, grass growth that will be coming on before we know it. Um, that really, that's part of the issue. Uh, it's kind of trying to get it out there ahead of time. Um, as things start to green up, we can run into some of these grass, grass tetany issues pretty quickly. So yeah, um, the spring calving cows, I want to see them on it about 30 days before um, calving, um, but you can you can still make a, a switch. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to be the, the UK high mag. There's, there's plenty of other high mags out there as well. Um, but if you want to use that one as a guideline or if, you, if your local uh, feed mill uh, produces that one, um, then, then that's fine too. Uh, good question. Is adding crushed lime a good alternative to offset the calcium and phosphorus concern when feeding 50% gluten and holes uh, versus a separate uh, mineral? Yeah. So um, that's another um, thing that you'll that we'll see in some of our our feeds that that get mixed is we can add uh, limestone uh, in as a as a source of calcium. Um, those co-product balancing minerals are are just a nice uh, mineral pack. Um, that that can get added, um, but yeah, we can we can add some some limestone to that as well uh, to the diet as well to increase uh, calcium because that's ultimately what we're trying to do there um, is is increase calcium without supplying any additional uh, phosphorus or as little extra phosphorus as possible. Um, so that would be my only other recommendation, depending on what your what your mineral looks like um, if you're mixing mineral in. Um, you may think about that co-product because you're going to get the extra calcium without adding uh, the extra phosphorus. So, and I didn't mention it, and but Dr. Anderson put it in the chat. Um, if you um, would be so kind as to fill out that the QR code, um, just a, a real quick survey about tonight's presentation, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. And also for those of you needing... Uh... CAPE credit for cost share. Um, the, tonight's code is UK men, M I N M I N UK men as in mineral. Also, and Dr. 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 Anderson, uh, real quickly on that, just to remind everybody. So that CAPE code goes in where the speaker signature normally goes on that form that you guys fill out for cre uh, educational credit. And it has to go through your County, ag agent uh, you you can't send me an email and say give you credit that we can't do it at the state level that all has to go through your county agent so be sure and and work with your county agent on that dr van valen did you see the question on kns uh yep yeah. um yeah so let me go back up there just care to give your opinion yeah. on kentucky nutrition service 
Yep. So they, um, they have a lot of different, um, products out there. They've got some good mineral. They mix, as far as I'm aware, I know at one time they mix some of the IRM mineral for folks. Um, so yeah, they, as you know, as long as you know what you're, you're getting, I mean, that's, I'm fine with, with, uh, using them. I think they've actually supplied some mineral for some of the, the research that we've done here over the years. So. Several excellent feed companies that provide fantastic mineral. Yep. We're yep. And I dropped in the chat um, a link to the IRM recommendation sheet that I talked about um, and the publications on reading a mineral tag and uh, mineral supplementation for beef cattle. Um, so we just updated that one a few months ago. Well, unless anybody has any quick questions, uh, again, we appreciate everyone's attention tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Van Valen, for a fantastic uh, update and uh, education on minerals. I know that's a question you and Dr. Lemcooler get a ton. And I, you know, even as the repro guy, I get a pile of uh, mineral, uh, mineral questions. So uh, appreciate the update. Um, corn silage selenium content. Uh, maybe a, a touch low in that one as well. I would um, still recommend providing selenium uh, supplement in that, that instance as well. Thanks again for everybody tuning in. Uh, this is the last one we're going to have this winter. Um, UK Beef Group will probably kick this up again uh, maybe in the summer, but certainly next fall. Um, and so I'd be looking out for announcements in September uh, about uh, the next series of webinars. And uh, if anybody has any, uh, wants to go back and view these, they are available. Um, Got to give us a couple of days, but we'll get them up on the UK Animal and Food Science YouTube uh, channel. Um, and um, all the ones from, from the past, we had Shooting the Bull, and we had Dr. Perry. Um, so anyhow, it uh, we are, uh, did I shut the gate? That's really funny. <laughs> That's from the I Bought a Farm series for anybody that, I, I know at least one person viewed it. Uh, but anyhow, um, thanks everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you next fall. If we don't see it, Master Cattleman or any of the various educational programs we're putting on this winter.